cancer is one of the most common types of cancer in women worldwide. And although it can affect women at any age, risk factors can increase as we get older. Welcome to Coffee Talk with Brigetti. We simply talk about life and stuff that matter to us as humans. It could be stuff that warms our heart, concerns us, scares us, or even just something that's topical at the moment. But we keep it family friendly. So come and hang out with us and join us in the chat. When we come back, we talk to Kasia. It's Breast Cancer Awareness Month. And so we want to talk a little bit about that to help raise awareness. Don't go away. We will be right back. And welcome back. If you're just joining us, welcome to Coffee Talk with Brigetti. The stream is made possible by StreamYard and Live Media. And if you want to know when we go live, please go ahead and like our Facebook page so that you get the notification. And please also um, head over to YouTube and click the subscribe button and the notification bell. And today on our Coffee Talk, we're going to be raising awareness about breast cancer since it's Breast Cancer Month. We know it's already the end of the month but rather late than never. So if you don't know me, I'm Brigetti Lambanda from Cape Town in South Africa. And again, welcome to the show. My guest today is Kasia. She's an international leadership mentor and coach, and she launched her business MindQuest Global seven years ago to help leaders develop the skills they need in today's modern business environment. But for today, we're going to talk about her personal journey to help raise cancer awareness. And so with that, let's welcome Kasia to the show, shall we? Kasia, welcome to the show. Great to have you. Thank you, Brigetti. It's a pleasure to be here with you again. It's been it's been a while, and so it's it's time that we catch up again. <laughs> yes, I believe it's been over a year since we we last had our conversation. So I'm really excited to be here and talk about this topic. It's it's certainly been one of the most challenging years uh, that I've had as a caregiver. Um, while I've been looking after my mother who was diagnosed with breast cancer last year. So I'm really happy to be here to share what I can about what I've learned um, uh, through this journey. Uh, and I think unfortunately, a lot of the time we tend to learn these things after someone is diagnosed. And I think it's important to share some of these insights earlier so that more people are aware of what they can be thinking about to help prevent cancer and uh, to help prevent this kind of experience if, if they can. Mm. And you know what? It's been a trying time, you know, or having cancer, a disease, any kind of illness is difficult at any time. You know, there's no good time to have a disease. There's no good time to be ill. There's no good time to be a caregiver. But I think during covid uh, has added another layer of complexity to living with a disease, to caregiving, to dealing with it, um, you know, hospital visits. Everything has been very, very different and challenging um, this year. My, my, my dad um, died almost two years ago, and, you know, I talk often about how challenging it would have been had we needed to give him the level of care that he needed during COVID. So my heart really goes out to anyone um, that is needing to do this at this time. But let's circle back to your mom and how she was diagnosed. Can you talk a little bit about the, 
the process of um, of her diagnosis? Yes, sure. So, you know, my, my mother was going for regular screening in Canada, and the regular screening included um, mammogram checks. She was actually getting a mammogram done regularly. Um, I understand, you know, the normal process in Canada was to have both a mammogram done and an ultrasound the very first time. But the follow-up was only done with mammogram. And unfortunately, in her case, that didn't show her her cancer and a lot of the time mammograms do miss cancers even though that's the the most prevalent screening test that's used mm. um the other thing is you know when we later looked at her medical records we saw that when they looked at her mammograms they saw some things and they just noted that it was probably benign mm. uh, and no one sent her for a follow-up uh, of any kind with an ultrasound after that very first one. So what actually happened is that we were on vacation in Europe and my mom told me that she had a lump of some sort and that she was a bit concerned about it, but that she'd been for a mammogram in February. And then we, you know, we were meeting up only a couple of months after that mammogram. And so I decided to take her for an ultrasound within that week. And the reason I knew about the ultrasound is because I'd gone while you my, were in Europe. While we were in Europe, yeah. Okay. I had done my own screening earlier in the year in Australia and I was sent for both. And mm -hmm. uh, I knew then that, you know, perhaps it would be a wise idea to take her for, for the ultrasound to at least have an idea if, you know, if that may show something. And unfortunately, it did. Um, she had already, you know, a three centimeter tumor in her breast. And at that point, they didn't know if that tumor was malignant or benign. So she had to go for a biopsy in Europe. And that came back, you know, five days later as malignant. So that was how she was diagnosed. Um, and unfortunately, she had a very aggressive cancer. So we had the details at that point that it was, um, going to be potentially a fast growing cancer. And we had to make a very quick decision about what we were going to do, whether we would return back to Canada for the treatment or whether we would you know, stay in, in Europe and uh, try and have some uh, a surgery done there. But thank goodness that you um, knew about not relying solely on the mammogram, um, yes. you know, the lady called Le uh, Leslie Nance, who's a, a certified cancer coach. And one of the things she highlights is that, um, you know, the density of each woman's breast is different. And so because of that uh, density, chances are high that cancer can be missed in a mammogram. And so you can't solely rely on that. And I think it's important that women know that because it's may give us a false sense of security um, if we rely only on the mammogram. You know, people go every two years or four years or whatever, um, and they kind of get the all clear, and they think, well, I'm okay. You know, even if I, I have a lump, the mammogram said there's nothing, so it's okay. Exactly, yeah. And that's that's one of the reasons I wanted to talk about this, because, you know, from everyone that I've talked to, there, women are not aware a lot of the time that it would be beneficial to also have an ultrasound and that they can be asking for an ultrasound to go along with the mammogram. Uh, because, you know, potentially the ultrasound will show something, potentially the mammogram will show something and the ultrasound won't. But at least it's some sort of backup because there's not, you know, unless you go for an MRI, there's not really a, a clear... Uh, tests, that's 100%. The MRIs are, are more reliable, but of course, a lot more expensive for, for a medical system. Mm. So, so I think what we are saying is that um, look at, be, be open to looking at other options, if, especially if you have a lump. Um, be open to getting it checked out, you know, do more than one test. Yeah, I would always, you know, for myself personally, I'm, I'm actually going on Monday 
and I've requested, you know, both to be done at the same time. Um, and uh, I, I would definitely continue down that path down the road. I wouldn't put 100% of my trust just in one of those tests. And the other thing is I will definitely be asking to see my own medical records and, and to read them. And that's not standard practice here in Canada. They tend to stay with the doctor. Uh, I think that's not just in Canada. Um, I think that happens everywhere else, you know, and, and sometimes people kind of, you know, well, the doctor knows best. Some people have that kind of, um, what do you call it? Take on life that, you know, the doctor knows everything. Trust the doctor. But I think what one wants to say is that you need to empower yourself and ask for your medical records. So in your experience, why would you say it's so important to ask for your medical records and to know what's in there? Yeah. Well, you know, for one, um, the, the records are being reviewed by a radiologist, right? And they have to make some sort of an assessment right then mm. and there. And they see so many of these um, every day, right? Then that assessment then goes to the doctor who also tends to be extremely busy here in Canada. Our general practitioners are maxed out completely. It's so hard to even get a general practitioner of your own. Um, and so the busyness factor for one, um, if you don't you know, take care of yourself first, then I think putting 100% of your trust that somebody else is going to check all the boxes and make sure that nothing falls through the cracks, mm -hmm. you know, it, it's a bit risky from that perspective. Not to say, of course, the doctor most likely uh, wants to do the right thing and uh, isn't intentionally missing, you know, something um, in your care. Uh, we have a, my mo mother has had a lovely doctor who really takes her time, you know, but unfortunately in this case, the system was that the, the, only the mammograms were being done as a follow-up. And it's more of the system issue that this, this fell through the, the cracks, so to speak. And unfortunately it, it was missed for at least a couple of years, you know, two and a half years or, or so. Um, I would That's say. That's a long time. Yes, it is a long time. And so it got to the point where by the time she got her diagnosis, she had stage three cancer. We're so lucky that we caught it in time. Uh, unfortunately, then when she had her surgery in, in August, you know, they had to take out a lot of lymph nodes because they did find those initial lymph nodes did have cancer. So they ended up removing 18 lymph nodes, and that's a, a lot of lymph nodes to be losing under your, your arm. Um, you know, it, it's created a lot of pain for her. So if something is caught earlier, that surgery is going to be a lot more minor. Um, mm. And, you know, perhaps only three lymph nodes, those first three lymph nodes get removed. In her case, because they could see that there was cancer, one of those lymph nodes was over one had over one and a 1.2 centimeters uh, of tumor in it already. So it was there for quite a long time. And, um, you know, it meant that uh, it was a radical mastectomy, which created a, a, a much larger surgical site, uh, which of course takes longer to recover from and requires much more maintenance throughout the rest of your life to move and make sure that area doesn't collect fluid from you know, the body lymph fluid collecting um, under the arm and in the arm, etc. So these are not, you know, pleasant things to talk about. But I just think it's so important to highlight that if something like this does happen, if you do get cancer, and we know that these days, unfortunately, one in eight women in North America, I don't know the whole, you know, statistics globally, but in North America, it's one in eight women right now, who get breast cancer. And the sooner we can possibly catch it, the more minor the surgery will be. And, you know, hopefully you don't have to go through the whole extent of a, a treatment, which is pretty, you know, heavy going um, to get mm. through chemotherapy and radiation on, on top of that. Mm. Um, yeah. Let's talk a little bit about um, your mom's journey with cancer and um, and mindfulness. 
how has has mindfulness impacted her cancer journey well you know i'll say it's still a, a work in progress um you know it, it's something that for her um has been a shift in the sense that she worked very hard all of her life you know she actually had a very stressful uh, business um, and she didn't really take the time to look after herself because she was so busy with everything else in her life but doesn't that happen to a lot of women it does yeah and that's that's you know why i'm talking about it now i mean as a as a leadership coach i see this all the time right we have a culture of busyness and well both men and women are spending a lot of time stressed right now uh, and so that chronic stress the ongoing stress it produces you know a cortisol levels in the body noradrenaline levels it leads to that fight or flight response and mm -hmm. so my mom was living a lot of her life in fight or flight she was looking at the clock running around not always eating properly not really always you know she used to go to the gym but she stopped going to the gym um and really just kind of um neglecting herself which she's now aware of you mm -hmm. know and very sad about i mean of course she has regrets about how she um neglected her her own care um which at the time she she didn't realize it would have this kind of impact right so she's a lot more mindful about, you know, what she's eating, um, getting out for walks every day. I mean, she's now retired, so she's got more time. But overall, you know, it's just really that conscious living of, you know, what you're doing with your body every day, what you're doing with your mind. Um, because, you know, the risk factors for cancer are this tendency to be running around you know, taking care of everything around you, uh, being, you know, sacrificial in how you take care of everybody else, but not taking care of yourself. Uh, and uh, these, these are the kinds of things that actually boost uh, inflammation in the body. And we know that when there's inflammation, that is a huge cancer risk because the body is trying to fix itself in certain areas so wherever the cancer might arise that's an area often where there's been inflammation and the multiplication of cells these um you know inflammation factors that are released into the body often result in in cancer and so if uh, people are living in you know in despair with the sense of helplessness that they don't have control over their lives or their schedule um and everything else is sort of happening to them instead of them stepping back mindfully and taking um, some level of responsibility for their own health and well-being uh, having those tough conversations to you know sometimes set boundaries with work with a partner um, and being very clear about what you need to maintain your own health you know, is so important. Uh, and mm -hmm. this is an area that I end up talking to a lot of my clients about, because no matter what they're doing, sometimes, you know, it's easy for things to get out of control, and we have to sort of rein it back in and look at, well, what do we need to prioritize? You know, how do we prioritize it with everything else that's going on? It's always um, a, balance like act, um, a balancing act, isn't it? And, you know, we don't always get it right. <laughs> Well, and you know, it's, it's interesting because there are a few different schools of thought about that, right? So there's always the talk of work-life balance, right? But there's also uh, actually just making the decision that this is going to be an essential part of your life and that prioritizing your self-care, whether it's that 30-minute walk that you need to do, whether it's, you know, 20 minutes <clears throat> of yoga um, to just get your mind to be at peace, um, it's whatever you personally need to prioritize to have a sense of, you know, calm and well-being in your life, despite everything else going on around you. And certainly that's been a, a huge test this year with the pandemic, 
Uh, but I see it anyway, you know, even years before that, when when you get on that treadmill of busyness, it can be hard to stop. So just pulling back and really assessing actually, you know, what's needed, simply making it a priority and non-negotiable. Mm. Um, that's what allows you to create that that balance. You know, talking about the mind and mindfulness, um, I think we often underestimate the power of the mind. There was a, a friend of mine in Canada said something the other day and it, it struck a chord with me. And he was saying that, you know, he stopped smoking on this day after he'd been smoking for many years. And he says the reason why I stopped smoking on that day is because he wasn't trying to stop smoking. He decided to stop smoking. It was a mm -hmm. conscious decision made that from that day forward, he was no longer going to smoke. He wasn't trying. He just did it. And, um, you know, and I think for a lot of people, when you have a disease, for example, when it comes to making choices like changing your diet, because you now have a life event that determines um, that you need to make a radical change in your diet. And guess what? You make up your mind, you have to make up your mind then to make that change. Now, Leslie Nance, that I spoke about earlier, who's a cancer coach, she also said something interesting um, talking about eating and diet. Um, she said that when you eat, you are either feeding your body, you are either feeding your mind, or you are feeding your disease, and in this case, cancer. Mm -hmm. So what you put in your body is either, you know, either going to be good for you, heal your body, or it's going to be feeding your cancer, promoting the growth of the cancer. So those are decisions that you then need to, to make. And empowerment is then so powerful so that you can make the right choices. Yeah. And, and, you know, what we've learned is that diet plays such a huge part in this, you know, so one of the first things my mother had to do is stop sugar because sugar feeds cancer. Mm. Um, so she does have some, you know, like she does eat fruit, um, but other sugar she has completely cut out. Um, and, you know, I, I was actually looking at some studies that were done because one of the key things that a lot of people think that, you know, if you have this genetic predisposition uh, for, for cancer, you know, with the, um, the uh, BRCA1 and 2 genes, a lot of women who have those genes tend to have a double mastectomy done like Angelina yeah. Jolie did, right? But there was a study that was done, it was interesting at the University of Montreal where they looked at the risk of, um, you know, actually getting cancer, re the, the reduction in the risk by simply diet and eating more fruits and vegetables. And what they found is that the women that were eating at least uh, 27 different types of fruits and vegetables a week, so the variety was really important. Mm. They had a 73% reduction in actually getting cancer. Whereas, you know, that's it, huge. That's it, huge. It is huge. Yeah. And it was considered, you know, kind of like, you know, well, no, you know, you're, you're pretty much guaranteed to get cancer with those genes. But I think it's, it's important for people to just be really aware that it used to be that we had this mindset that our genes, you know, this is how they, they dictate our, our health, right? But genes are regulated and controlled by what we put into our body. And some genes are expressed. The, the mm. proteins are produced based on that expression of genes. So this is, you know, something that we've discovered over the last number of years. Um, and that's, that's why diet makes such a huge difference. That's why controlling stress levels makes such a huge difference because what's produced in the body is then different. It's like, you know, putting different ingredients into, into the soup, right? Into your own body, <laughs> essentially. <Absolutely. laughs> That's um, exactly what it is. Yeah. And they found the same thing, you know, with prostate cancer, when men were eating um, omega-3 rich fish with, you know, oily fish like salmon, they were getting yeah. a reduction in, in cancer. Yeah. Things like green tea. Green tea is actually extremely good at 
apparently reduces cancer by up to 50% because it has certain compounds uh, in it. When one of the compounds is ECGC, I believe. And so these are all, you know, small things that we've learned along, you know, this journey that I think are really important for people to just be aware of, because it's pretty easy to just sneak a green tea into your day and be getting the benefits uh, of that, right? I personally, I don't like the taste of green tea, but I mix it with other teas and, <laughs> you know, drink it that way. It's um, an acquired taste, but you know, I find that when I I haven't cut out sugar completely from my diet, but I have reduced it significantly, and it's amazing how your taste buds adjust. Um, and I'm finding that my coffee tastes different. I'm tasting the coffee more, you know, uh, everything else. I'm I'm really tasting things better without the sugar component. Yeah, well, I so find a lot of it's mind over up. matter. It yeah. does, yeah. I used to take sugar in my coffee and tea years ago too, and I did stop. Um, I, I personally cannot even have a coffee now that has any sugar in it because I actually really love the taste of a good coffee. So you're right, your your taste buds adjust, and um, you know now if I I'm given a coffee <laughs> by somebody else, I, I had this <laughs> issue when I was traveling in Indonesia when I was traveling in Morocco people were putting so much sugar in my tea. I had to, those were, you know, the few words that I had to learn is, you know, less, less no sugar, sugar, no sugar. <laughs> so along with, you know, hi, bye, <laughs> how are you? <laughs> I learned how to say no sugar, please, <laughs> in Indonesian. <laughs> so, yeah. Oh my goodness. I'd like to also talk a little bit about, um, your experience about a caregiver and what you can share about that. So we're going to take a short break and when we come back, let's talk about caregiving. Thanks for staying with us. Let's talk a little bit about your journey as a caregiver. What have you learned over these last couple of months? Oh, Pajati, you know, <laughs> this one is is a, a heavy one for me. Um, th this has been really tough, I have to tell you, you know, because I have often felt like there's very little that I can actually do. Um, you know, the, there's... Uh, my mom, my mother had a lot of different symptoms throughout this journey, throughout chemotherapy, throughout radiation. Um, and often I had this feeling of um, helplessness, unfortunately, because a lot of the time we couldn't work out what could be done, if anything, about some of these symptoms. You know, so she spent about a week, 10 to 10 days, having a lot of digestive problems, not being able to sleep. Um, and, you know, having um, neuropathy, loss of feeling in her leg. And you try and, you know, seek help. A lot of the time that looked like, you know, calling the nurse line and sometimes spending up to three, four, five hours on the phone talking to different people and trying to find some solutions, you know. So, so it's a really time-consuming thing that... Um, you know, trying to find support, uh, it, it can be a very overwhelming. Um, and for me, it's it's been a big challenge because I've been balancing running my business because I didn't want my business to disappear completely while I became a caregiver. Sometimes I've had guilt with that because, you know, I felt like maybe I need to be dedicating more of my time as a caregiver. Um, Let's say that uh, I think the biggest things that I've learned is the things that I wasn't prepared for, the things that I'm not very good at, <laughs> the things that require more growth, you know, um, the, the importance of having my own time and space to maintain my sanity. You know, I, I've been doing yoga every day. And uh, even though my classes are all closed, I've been just taking my yoga mat for 10, 15, 20 minutes outdoors. 
and doing yoga outside because then I can be calmer and I can respond to situations that come up, you know, in a, a much better way. Whereas if I didn't do those things, um, you know, there's a natural sense of anxiety that comes up when dealing with, you know, various different side effects uh, in general. There, you know, I've, I've gone through months of grief. Um, I had to look up what that, what that was about because of course my mother is still here. Um, and I was going through a stage of an anticipation that we don't know what's going to happen, if she's going to survive, how long she's going to survive. And, and that was really, really tough for me to, to balance. I felt quite exhausted. And on top of, you know, everything else that's been happening the, the past few months, uh, that was a lot. So I would say... I think that mm -hmm. a lot of people miss that uh, about the caregiving process is that you almost, you know, you're constantly living with that sense of loss because you've actually lost a healthy mom is what you've lost, right? Because you have this expectation of health that this person is going to be with you for, you know, we can't really say, I mean, life is, is there's no guarantees in life, but when it comes to people in our circle, family, people that we love, we want them around in our lives for as long as we can possibly have them. Um, and when somebody gets a diagnosis of a disease that could potentially lead to loss of life, and if you're that intimately involved with the person in the process of the caregiving, you're really dealing with a lot of stuff that other people don't see. <laughs> Yes, yeah, most definitely. Um, you know, and, and a lot of that is hard work. And very often the patient doesn't want you to have to deal with those things because they feel embarrassed um, or they feel like they don't want to be a burden or they feel bad because they're taking up your time. They feel bad that they're taking up your energy. They feel bad that they're taking you away from your, your job or your family. And, you know, they feel like they're imposing. So there's, there's so many factors and emotions um, that you're having to deal with that other people in the family or in the circle, unless they've been on this journey themselves, it's things that they don't know of because, and there's no off, there's no off button, right? If you're a caregiver, there's no off button. You are always on duty. And so you are constantly having to find ways to fill up your tank because you can't permit yourself to run on empty because then you're no good to the person you're caring for. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, certainly I felt that difference that those days, for example, when it was raining heavily, and I didn't go outside to do my yoga, I felt I had less in the tank, I felt more impatient, I felt more grumpy, it was easier for us to clash. And, you know, we haven't, I'm, I'm living with my mother now again, after so, you know, decades, I haven't lived with her since I was 19. <laughs> so of course, that brings up its own complexity. And in general, as you said, that complexity of emotion, the complexity of everything that you're going through, it, it's, it's a lot to navigate. And, you know, working on our own communication internally, so that uh, I understand really what she she wants and needs. Um, it ha has been something that's been very helpful, you know, for us, because there can be sort of this idea of expectations. And if those ideas aren't discussed about what really is needed, then, mm. then I was feeling like I really need to be 100% available all of the time, which is impossible, really, in the end, you know, to to do and and I was also, you know, working with my own you know, executive coaching clients, um, which sometimes, you know, I, I was really debating, do I continue to do that and offer, you know, my time uh, or, or do I need to reduce it? But in the end, because I love my work so much, I was finding myself energized at the end of the sessions and I could bring more energy to the, the whole situation. 
So I had to really just watch myself as we talk, you know, we're talking about mindfulness. I had to really observe mm -hmm. my own energy, uh, observe my own responses, interactions, communication. You know, certainly I haven't been a perfect caregiver. I've had to learn a lot, a lot of new recipes as well, because, you know, I've been living in Australia the past few years and eating a lot of Asian foods. So I have a different palate <laughs> and my mother can't eat spicy food. So I've had to learn a lot now in terms of how I can support her and what, what she needs throughout this, this year. And yeah, I, I would say that um, right now I'm still in that process of learning to support her. It's not something that's done ever. <laughs> and don't you find that also one of the um, challenging things is trying to manage your own internal messaging and feelings um, because you don't want to transfer any positive, you know, possible negative energy <laughs> that you have onto the person that you're caring for. Um, you know, that's an, I find that that's another sort of complex thing. You don't want to be um, overly positive in a situation that doesn't, you know, isn't realistic. But you also don't want to um, let the person give up hope. You want to um, energize them. You want to give them some of your positive energy. And that in itself takes energy, isn't it? It takes a lot of energy to... Um, try and be positive for someone else when they may not be, when they may be very negative, for example. Um, yeah. So there's a, there's a lot of dynamics, you know, in, in, in caregiving that, uh, but it certainly teaches one things about yourself that you didn't know. It does. Yeah. And, you know, I would say that one of the key things that, um, you know, I, I tend to be overall quite optimistic and positive and, and, you know, I was really trying to provide a lot of encouragement and, and help to facilitate um, a, a shift in thinking, you know, that would produce sort of a, a better result in the sense that, you know, when we talk about this mindset and, and the impact of mindset and anxiety and stress on on cancer, I didn't want my mom's cancer to get worse because of, you know, her view of the situation. Because of course, in that en environment, it's easy to take a negative view. Um, and the, the biggest worry is that it's going to met metastasize to other parts of the body, right? So it's easy to be negative. And so for us, it was really hard to balance this, you know, together to be realistic that this could happen and at the same time not have anxiety or worry about this happening and for my mother it took a bit of work for myself as well to not be thinking about this on an ongoing you know basis but just to simply focus on daily life and doing everything simply that you can to to be healthy and take care of yourself you know versus thinking of the negative possibilities and I would say that there are times that I was likely trying to be too positive to lift her up instead of just allowing her to feel and, and simply being there for her. You know, so there, there may have been times that I kind of went into a bit of toxic positive positivity um, simply because I tend to be much more optimistic in, in general. And, uh, you know, it's something that I'm learning to balance myself now still in terms of how do you support someone with empathy um, based on, you know, where they are at in that moment to meet them where they are and then, you know, have that conversation about other perspectives, other ways to view the, the situation that they're in. And we've talked a lot about gratitude and, you know, it's, it's something that has been a bit of a challenge to, to identify things to be grateful for um, sometimes in this current year. <laughs> Not from my perspective, but from her perspective. And that is all we have time for today. Thank you so much for joining us. Until next time, you were watching Coffee Talk with Brigetti. Take care and goodbye for now.